Great, so uh, I'll just introduce to you all uh, our three panelists. So first off, we have Dr. Tina Wu. So Tina is a research fellow at Monash University and uh, Cyros Data 61. Uh, Tina's research focuses on human-centric cybersecurity, currently with a specific focus on phishing. Her research is to study how humans interact with security tools and apply AI to optimize security to reduce the involvement of security experts. She is also interested in cognitive modeling for human security behaviors and user education design. So we're very pleased to have you, Tina. Uh, our second panelist is uh, Dr. Heap Hong Pham uh, from RMIT CS CCSRI Vietnam Hub, and he's the lead of that hub. Uh, Dr. Pham has more than 10 years of teaching and research and managing information systems, systems analysis and design, networking and cybersecurity studies at RMIT University Vietnam. His main cybersecurity focuses are on understanding the security behavior of employees, communication techniques and building cybersecurity awareness and engagement culture in organizations. So I'm sure we're going to get a very nice broad perspective on this issue from you, fam. So we're very pleased to have you. Our third panelist is Fiona Hislop. Uh, she's the RMIT University Cybersecurity Change and Awareness Manager. Fiona has completed studies in behavioral science and marketing with extensive work experience in segment and product marketing, sales and business development across several industries. She joined RMIT to lead the cultural change program to uplift cybersecurity and reduce human risk. Her role is focused on driving and demonstrating long-term sustainable behavioral change by educating staff and students on cybersecurity threats, consequences, and best practice security methods. So we are so thrilled to have you. I think we will learn a lot about the practice of um, making people more cyber aware from you. So thank you so much for joining us, Fiona. All right, so before we start off, I'd like each one of you to give us a brief introduction of yourself, what your current role is, and why you think phishing and educating people on phishing is so important in today's day and age. Maybe we'll start with you, Tina. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so uh, he hello everyone, my name is Tina. I'm currently a research fellow at Monash University and Cyrus Data Six One. Um, I have obtained my PhD from Swinburne University last year, and my research topic was on humans, uh, humans understanding on security risks. So I have started my uh, research in cybersecurity, uh, in human-centric cybersecurity area since my PhD. And uh, since last year, I built my interests in phishing area. Um, so, uh, uh, and my interest um, normally focus on two parts. Um, the first one is human side, uh, like how do we understand um, the human factors and how and what what is the human vulnerabilities? Uh, and second part is how can we address them? Uh, like we can, uh, we always try to employ the AI based mechanisms or uh, solutions and, uh, and to, to build some some uh, useful technologies and to help users. At the same time, we are also trying to uh, build the human back to the loop. So we don't want uh, the users only to be the victims uh, in the cybersecurity ecosystems. Uh, we, we really need the knowledge, like their cognitive functions of them, and as well as the experts, um, the expertise. And so um, we have seen uh, the phishing is a cyber attack that uh, they always use the disguise uh, emails as the weapon. And they're always trying to impersonate the trusted organizations or uh, individuals to harvest the, the victims' credentials. And the phishing has been there for more than 20 years, but it's still there and never stops. Uh, like uh, e even we are trying very hard to like using the, uh, the rapid um, advanced AI, AI mechanisms and uh, to trying to boost the automatic detections for phishing attempts, but they still uh, uh, provide the opportunities for the fishes to become more and more sophisticated. And they are also uh, trying very hard to bypass the email filters. So um, we can see the, the state is on the automatic de detection is, is not always 100% accurate. Um, it's not perfect. 
users still uh, get the chance to face the real world phishing emails and they have to make the decisions sometimes by themselves. So, um, and the user and phishers are really smart. They know um, they are trying to take, take advantage of human trust, their curiosity, emotions, like sometimes uh, they will fail of, of um, not doing anything and try uh, and said, if you don't do this in 24 hours, you're gonna lose something. And uh, like curiosity, uh, here's something you, you're probably interested in, and then uh, I want to click and to see what happens there. So uh, here, here's the problem, like we are human and we're not machine. So in, in the, like even just a very small chance, uh, the average users uh, are still facing um, the difficult problems. And uh, so, uh, so I think that that is um, really important to bring some um, knowledge to the users so that they can uh, they can still have some understanding and to take the correct uh, security measures uh, when they are facing phishing. So I feel the uh, the like from the researcher side, we have to work really hard to protect the users. But from the user side, uh, they will also need to learn something and to protect themselves. Thank you. I Absolutely. Very, very valid point, Tina, that you shared about how it's actually the human emotions that are being preyed on. So user education is actually vital. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll now move to Fam. Fam, would you like to introduce yourself, uh, your current role and why uh, you got interested in fishing and why do you feel it's so important to educate people on, th on this topic? Yeah, uh, thank you, Arena. Uh, uh, Arati, sorry. Um, thank you, everyone. So I'm uh, currently is a senior lecturer in the logistics and uh, supply chain degrees at MIT Vietnam. Uh, before that, I also um, major in business information systems. So my background really much about uh, technologies and information systems. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, lead of the uh, C and the Cybersecurity Research Innovation Hub in Vietnam. Um, yeah, you know, I have been working with uh, Lucky and Matt. Um, so my my fo my focus area is pretty much on information management, um, security management, and especially on the human factor. Uh, and I have done a number of research. My PhD is also about uh, how uh, employees you know react to policies, to requirements that company require them to comply with. And to my studies that if we force a lot of you new know, policies and, and terms and jargons. Uh, they actually would be overloaded and simply they just ignore. You know, it's it one way that to avoid the reality, which is too complex to deal with, then they simply said or pass that responsibility to someone else. Um, so, and also I did a lot of interviews with, with employees and also I'm involved with uh, some technical manage, uh, administration uh, for a companies, um, for a number of companies. So I learned that employees are kind of struggling yeah, with security, even those we talk about phishing uh, and then phishing is one of the to me, it's very important to learn about uh, phishing because it's very effective in terms of the attacker. It's very low cost to launch, but it's very effective to win. Right. Um, and that way, even those companies have a lot of uh, technicals and and advanced techniques, but uh, they still get past the any kind of filtering that you may have. And in fact, uh, out the statistics, 33% of the cyber security attacks are uh, phishing, right? So you can see how much it is that would be part of the security risk. Uh, the second one is, you know, if phishing is still very effective, it can get past most of the most advanced filtering systems. And then that's why employees do see email that you know, later on will, will turn out to be uh, uh, an attack. Uh, also, because of the the, the impact from the phishing is also very dangerous. Uh, we're talking about data loss, uh, privacy loss, uh, you know, regulations and, and, and the numbers of, of, uh, poly, of uh, uh, compliance that the organization may be subject to if they can't protect their systems and their users from phishing attacks. Right? And the last one I would say is that even though phishing is very difficult to detect by machine, by computer, but it can be effectively detected by the user. So then again, it goes back to the user side, the human factor that we need to talk about and we increase the awareness. Thank you. 
Thank you, Pam. Very insightful there, uh, which, which is quite hopeful as well, because uh, while you know technology has helped us so much, what you've really highlighted is that if a well-trained user is actually the strongest protection uh, against a phishing attack. So thank you so much. Uh, I'll finally move on to Fiona. Fiona, would love to hear from you on uh, a little bit of your introduction, your current role, uh, and why you've been become so interested in phishing. Thanks, Sarathi. So I'm Fiona Hislop and my role in the university, as Arathi mentioned at the start, is to build the culture within our MIT um, staff and students around cyber culture. Um, it's a relatively new role. Um, I think in, traditionally we've seen cybersecurity has had the real tech space, the risk and the business continuity um, and the operational side of cyber. Uh, this now is seen as an equally important um, aspect to any cyber cyber function with your governance and compliance. Sometimes the role sits independently, sometimes it sits under that governance compliance role. Um, all large to medium organisations now, um, basically I guess it's driven by auditors, are sort of saying, well, where's your change in awareness cultural um, function sitting? Um, so it's elevated the, um, I guess, the requirement for this role. And I think moving forward, the skill set that someone's bringing to the role is still being, uh, it's sort of, um, it's picking up on marketing, but then I think you still need a technical side of it as you become more threat orientated. Um, and so I found myself here, I've had a lot of tech marketing background, um, behavioral science and um, also criminology background as well. So it's a good mix. Um, so phishing is only one aspect of my role, but obviously it's a key part because um, it's the human firewall and, you know, we can invest so much money in all other aspects of cyber. Um, you can have everything set up so that it's all uh, well protected, but it really does just take one staff or student member to go and click on something um, and we have a problem at our doorstep. Um, it's evolved significantly, even in the last three years um, since I joined RMIT, there has been um, phishing providers that provide a platform for us to um, push out simulations to staff. Um, those platforms have evolved considerably in terms of the complexity, the data analysis, what we know about people and the behaviours behind the scenes. Um, so it's a fascinating space in terms of that regard. Um, I sit here now three months later and I've got a really good handle on um, what everyone in the university is doing, um, who is susceptible, who's not. So I know my user groups that I can work with to actually spend more time with and really take them on that journey of learning so that they're not as susceptible to phishing. Um, the it, we've recently just uh, again it's part of our partner that we work with um, is a fish icon alert on our dashboard so that it's a lot easier for staff and student with staff actually to report phishing uh, we've got 12,000 FTE staff so it's a very big uh, staff base that we have to try and uh, manage I guess in terms of bringing them on that learning journey um, so it makes it easy to report but it's not so much those ones that matter because our systems and the AI can quickly pick up where there's issues. It's the spear phishing that we really need to be really, really careful of. That's the targeted ones that are uh, someone that's orchestrated based on facts on social engineering and really crafted a, a really good email that I think and I expect uh, there's nothing untoward, the sender looks legitimate and I click on it. And, and that's a real key thing that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that element of trust that you really can't trust anything. You have to check everything. And so whilst things might look a bit suspicious or a bit unusual, if it's falling in and it's part of something that would be expected, that's where, and you don't check that sender or that link, you're in trouble. So yeah, interesting space and it's come so far in such a short time and that's not within RMIT. That's the global players playing in this space to try and help the market evolve and help them get on top of fishing. I think that's very insightful, Fiona, because it's true. Um, uh, I think spear fishing is dangerous because uh, there's so much more trust that we have from the sender and which is why we kind of 
uh, sweep over things that we possibly would have be suspicious about if it was just a general email. So yeah. thanks, thanks for highlighting that. Fantastic. So I think we're going to have some really, really um, great conversations here. Uh, I'd like to start by asking uh, you, Tina, if you could walk us through a typical phishing attack. Like, what does it look like? from the um, attacker's perspective, and what does it look like from a user's perspective? Uh, yes, so um, so before I touch on um, the, the one typical attack, I would like to uh, just touch a little bit about the knowledge uh, of how an attacker performed their, um, their phishing. So uh, you, as you know, the, the main goal of the phishing is uh, trying to uh, like uh, leverage uh, the uh, users' vulnerabilities and trying to uh, harvest their credentials like their credit cards, their accounts, uh, or sometimes distribute the malware, trying to gain the remote access of their computers. So uh, what they what they are doing, so pr uh, prior to any uh, uh, real phishing attacks, the, uh, the attackers always uh, spoofs a website by using the existing legitimate layouts, like copying their look, and uh, make it uh, look like uh, it is make it difficult for the average users to distinguish between the legitimate one and the fake one. So uh, there are many phishing kits that can uh, can be used to perform this task. And then the attackers trying to send the messages, mostly uh, using the emails to the users, and then try uh, leveraging the social engineering to uh, ins uh, insist that uh, the, the uh, an action is needed and uh, trying to uh, lure the users to click on the link uh, to their phishing website. Uh, if the victim uh, is successfully fooled, uh, the, then the victim will visit the website and submit their uh, sensitive information, uh, such as the credentials, or there will be some malicious, uh, like malicious things downloaded at the back end, like Trojan or uh, some other virus. Um, and they uh, they can they sometimes we also received a confirmation message said uh, to uh, minimize the suspicions of the attack after the fact. So um, and then the uh, the phishing website will transmit the victim's information back to the phisher, uh, and they then the, the phishers can uh, use the the sensitive information to uh, to get the monitor again either directly or indirectly. So, um, like uh, once they get your your accounts, they can uh, log in and do uh, like for the bank accounts, they can do the transfer directly. Or sometimes they get your uh, sensitive information, they can use your uh, identity to open a bank account or uh, get a credit card or apply for a passport or so doing some other illegal activities. Uh, and sometimes we may think about uh, maybe I, I just uh, give my my name and my address probably not a big problem but the issue is uh, now it's a digital um a digital world so uh everyone can find uh, some part of your information online such as on your social media like i can find your data first your photos email information about your friends your uh, relationship or families then i can easily perform the attack um, so, um, based on the uh, on the uh, on the knowledge, and then uh, we can uh, talk about um, the typical one, which I uh, I'd like to talk about the spill fishing. So, as uh, Fiona already touched, that uh, um, I I think that's um, um, that's a very important one because it can be uh, evolved to some other like more dangerous one. Uh, but spill fishing is really just um, very general and is advanced uh, and not like the mass phishing. So mass phishing is something sent to a massive amount of users saying you have won the iPhone and or you win a prize and please click the link. That's less crafted. So not many users would click the link. Um, but different from that, the spill phishing is uh, the phisher already knows a little bit about you. Like I said, your address, what title you are and where are where do you work? And then uh, um, the, and then they're trying uh, more. That they, they would devote more time or money into uh, crafting the message, and they, the message can claim urgency one way or another, either by stating that uh, there is an important message from your bank or 
popular service or or some or trying to impersonate your uh, your colleagues or your boss or something uh, something like that. And uh, an example is during the COVID nineteen, uh, some people might receive the information about the uh, vaccines. Like they probably know you're gonna take a vac vaccine, and then they say this is uh, the the payment for the early access access or uh, this is the confirmation of your vaccines or uh, like we're, we're working remotely during the COVID and probably some some uh, day we will receive an email from the IT help desk saying you have to change your passwords now uh, and uh, uh, do, like to comply with the security policies our policy has changed and something like that so uh, the spill phishing is really uh, really dangerous and uh, also um, have very high success rate. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. That was really, um, really interesting to know how much uh, we put of ourselves on social media and other online uh, platforms. Even just our, you know, profile, our professional profile can reveal so much to an attacker if they really wish to attack uh, and do a spear phishing attack. So, thanks, Tina. That's really insightful. Um, <clears throat> fam, so I'd like to ask you, uh, since you've looked very closely at uh, different uh, phishing attacks, what are the impacts of phishing on an organization and also on an individual? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Rati. So um, in terms of uh, phishing, it's just one of the cybersecurity attacks, right? And if we look at cybersecurity's uh, attributes, it has three main dimensions. You have three main, we call the triangles, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And then phishing attacks, you actually try to compromise either you know, uh, confidentiality, Probably not much by integrity, to my own um, opinion, but most of them, they're actually uh, focusing on getting some confidential information from you or from the organization. And because of that, uh, uh, that loss of confidentiality, there, there are actually about the main four uh, consequences or impacts on organization and individual. First is about financial impacts. Uh, cyber, uh, phishing attack can get you know, uh, confidential information, username and password, can also get even bank accounts, right? Um, those, those. The, so from that, they, they can either steal money from you um, if that your bank account, right? Somehow they can. Also, they can actually send you uh, or ask you to send money to their own account, right? So that is one way they even steal money from you. And in fact, one of my students when I taught my MBA class, just at the first day of the class, he told me that. His company just lost about 8,000 uh, euros uh, because of the phishing attacks. And act phishing attack is actually very, very intricate and very complex. It's not simple, um, which I guess hopefully can tell at the end uh, of the second part of the discussion. So the, the bank, the company simply just sent 10,000 uh, euros to um, a phishing attacker. Uh, somehow they can kind of interfere into the emails. Uh, also, because of loss of confidentiality, in many industry, like banking, health industry, education, uh, companies are subject to um, regulatory regulatory compliance. And we're talking about millions of dollars if the company cannot protect the, the uh, confidentiality of their customer. So once the company store the customer information, they are liable and responsible for protecting that. And if they can't prevent a phishing attack, they are subject to huge, huge fines um, uh, the second one is about rep reputation impact. Uh, you know how embarrassing it is right? that certainly thousands or millions of customer information are posted on the dark web, on public website, and even you know, uh, put it put in on, on sales you know, um, uh, because of that compromise that they uh, launched the attack. So it's huge impact on reputation. It's embarrassment as well. Right? Um, we have cases where certainly um, a lot of customer call back to the company and say, hey, we received an email from you and uh, asking, you know, uh, something that very weird, very strange. And then we realize that our computer have been compromised because someone have opened a phishing email and click and open. It used the contact list in your Outlook and then just, you know, launch out a very embarrassing email. And it looked it look very bad on the IT people. <laughs> we like, 
what have we done? You know, how can we protect this? Um, of course, on to the investor, right, to the stakeholder, that that security now is actually you know, reflect a professionalism, uh, you know, a, a well resource, you know, uh, of a company. So if you can't protect your own you know, information, how can you, you know, do auditing properly, right? And now security is part of almost. I look at a few of the business tender. They always ask about what is your cybersecurity policy in addition to financial capability, you know, your staff resource qualification, and then how you manage your security. Uh, how do you put effort and, and even investment on your on protecting that? Uh, the third one is about intellectual properties. Uh, so because confidentiality also you know, relates to some um, financial trade patterns, you know, uh, scientific uh, algorithms, so that when it's compromised, that also uh, uh, compromise that intellectual properties that you have spent uh, a lot of money to develop. Uh, the last one is about business disruption and productivity. Every time when yeah, uh, some uh, the IT team, I'm sure when they receive an email that some some uh, staff just click on the link uh, and do provide you know, some password, the first thing you would say, please change your email, right? And that is, if you're looking at you know, a large scale, a big organization, that's a lot of work right, to reset the password. And uh, especially if to do with a bank, it's not, you know, there's a lot of, of, of unproductive time that you have to deal with. The IT, IT staff have to restore data. If you actually lose the data you know, or, or data corrupted, then you need to restore. So you get, you need to get from backup data, you need to restore it. It takes a day, it takes two days, right? That's a lot of disruption. Repatching the system. So we know that when it's compromised, as, as uh, Tina said, sometimes they launch, you know, uh, uh, launch malware into your system. That's even worse. That take, you know, just scan the whole system, take the system offline, uh, scan it, find the patch, find the malware, patching it. That maybe it's a few more days as well. So that's a lot of business disruption and productivity. Whenever someone reported that, I just click on the link and my heart just like thumped coming up and say, <laughs> why you do that? So it's caused a lot of work for me. So yeah, that is some some of summaries of um, I think about the impact on you know, fishing on, on organization and individual. Thank you. Thank you, fam. In fact, I think what you've highlighted is um, it's quite disruptive from many, many different angles, apart from financial loss and personal loss. Uh, of uh, you know reputation, it also disrupts business continuity uh, and also creates a lot of overhead trying to restore the systems back to back to normal operations. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, I'll, I'll come to Fiona now. Fiona, you're a practitioner and you're trying to defend your organization against many cybersecurity threats, including phishing. Uh, what are some of the methods that you have found have been actually effective? Uh, against phishing. Fiona, you are on mute. Sorry. Um, look, I I sit here. We're still on a, a on a big journey. I think um, I could confidently say if you had someone who really sat down and orchestrated a really targeted spear phishing. Um, there would be a high chance that it would still get through. So my journey is far from over. Uh, we recently recognised 12 staff within the university who consistently had checked every single email and identified it as a phishing and, or a simulation. Um, and the next step is not just being able to identify it, it's knowing to report it. Because if, if people do click on a link and, and go, oh goodness, they need to not feel embarrassed and shamed. They must pick up the phone and reach out. So the um, the the knowledge of where you go to get help has been also a big part of my journey. You know, you can go online, um, but we've got the report phishing icon, but you're not going to just send something through if you've actually clicked on something. You've got to ring IT support and get that help straight away. Um, I've personally been privy to people who have been scammed via phishing and they've been absolutely mortified. We're talking highly educated people and I have seen the conversations that they've had with the attacker while the attacker is instructing them to beat against and to work around the systems. And it is very, very confronting when you see that dialogue and how they actually worked. It's 
it's a whole different level because you're in a different zone as the person being attacked. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge we've had, um, and it's it's it touches on both your areas, is that we've got a culture where people can identify phishing now, um, or they'll know something's not quite right, and they'll instead of like reporting it, which they may do, they'll reach out and say or send it to the cybersecurity area, going, "Is this phishing?" Now it's causing chaos when I do a simulation because we might have or there might be let's say there's a, a genuine RMIT email going out instead of people accepting it on face value they're now coming back and querying it which is a great culture to have we want that we don't want that to stop but what we don't want is an influx of a thousand calls to the cyber center saying is this legitimate so the path we need people to take is to be able to look at URLs and make an informed decision that this is not right instead of just going <laughs> fish alert and sending it in in our way that is a very hard thing to do because once you start analyzing domain names and urls it's complex and um it's way past the 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 lay person in most organizations um and i think the tools need to get better but we also need to make people understand you need to try and look at this and and look at what it's doing and where it's taking you instead of just going, by all means, speak to the person next to you, does this sound right? Or know who your cyber expert in your area is, but that's been made more complex with remote working because they don't have someone beside them that they can just say, what do you reckon about this URL? Um, so there's certainly challenges there, but so it, we've certainly come on a journey, but we're in a place now where, um, we need to work around some of the issues. The, the other challenge that I have at the moment is um, because I send out these phishing simulations quite frequently and, and people do get caught out, they're complaining and going, stop sending me this nonsense. How dare you send me this? So whilst we've got, you know, the support of the head of the uni to go, that's okay to do phishing, we're on an educational journey. You've got a subgroup that's just getting furious and angry about what we're doing. And they're missing the whole point around why we're doing it. Uh, and so we've got to work with that cohort too, to sort of go, I'm not, my role is not to sit here and annoy you. It's actually to actually take you on the different tactics and methods that the scammers use so that you can understand that and not fall for it next time. But it gets really, some of the emails we get, are scathing about what we do and again it it's, it's all around the behavioral science side of it from another angle um so yeah interesting definitely fiona i think you know uh, you as you rightly say uh the cost of one small mistake sometimes uh, is so extreme that it is worth the slight discomfort of having a simulation email so that we get educated on the right practice. So I uh, really appreciate all the work that you're doing to keep um, you know, this organization secure. So really appreciate that. Thank now, you. we do have a few questions from, uh, I'll just uh, scroll up. Um, so a baby had a question, is there any comprehensive study showing the magnitude vulnerability to phishing and the extent of efficiency of current mitigating current mitigating awareness and education in Australia. So are there any widespread studies that we, we can have access to to see how pe vulnerable people are and how well we are doing uh, to protect With against remediation. Mm -hmm. If you look at, there's a website which know before is our the, is the main yeah. Um, phishing simulation provider globally, uh, one of two. Um, if you look at their statistics, I think it, it's the improvement from having no simulation and then even from the first simulation, my understanding that I read recently, I think there was a 40% uplift in awareness around phishing just from one simulation. And after a 12 month program, you're considerably better off. Um, so yeah. There's definitely statistics. I don't have them offhand, but if you look up no before uh, phishing um, benefits, you would get the exact stats on that. Fantastic. Thanks, Fiona. Appreciate that. Sam, go ahead. Um, I actually don't have specific figure for Australia, but in, in general, some of the uh, cybersecurity uh, service provider, they do the, the statistics. So 
nearly 90% of all businesses receive some form of phishing attack, uh, phishing um, email, right? Um, and then probably about uh, one tenth of that may have some click on that uh, that link. So basically, that huge amount of phishing attack out to almost every organization, small or large, because depends on the, the, the strategy they use, they may use spam kind of attack. So with spam, you would send millions of random email, even random address right, um, to organizations. And from that, you know, we we'll get just a tiny fraction, we we'll get someone respond, that's good enough. For spear phishing attack, it's much more targeted, but um, when you look at that, then, then that's a different kind of game. But here I'm talking about the, the spam type of phishing attacks where um, they are software that can generate domain or test domains. We just ping you know, the domain. If the domain responds, we know it exists. And from that domain, I just get a random name and people have you know, first name, uh, last name or first name dot last name. They just try own uh, combinations and then just, just you know, mass email. Uh, and somehow they would get through to someone. So that kind of attacks on most, you know, would, would attack indiscriminately, um, regardless of, of uh, as long as you go online, you get some kind of domain names, they can test and they can, they can find you. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think automation has made everything so much easier, uh, you know, for us as well, uh, trying to protect, but also for the attackers, just the volume of attacks that they can do with minimal effort is incredible. Uh, Tina, do you have anything to add to that? I, I, your any, uh, research that you're aware of that, that has studied about the effectiveness of some of the current strategies or um, how vulnerable we are at this stage? Uh, yes, I think um, for the, I think most of uh, current phishing awareness campaigns are not very uh, effective um, because most of them are using the materials might be designed five or six years ago and those phishings are not uh, you know uh, prevalent uh, nowadays especially during COVID you probably are uh, really hard to find any uh, phishing training about COVID-19 um, and uh, yeah I, I think that but but I think people still need it because that's the basic knowledge they have to gain but the, the I do feel the phishing training uh, campaign needs to be updated like every few months or uh, one uh, one year but but I uh, honestly I don't have experience in uh, in running the campaign so I, I don't know how it costs but I think this yeah uh, it's oh, just, to do. yeah Tina just on that one the um, providers now um, the simulations available on the fly so if something was circulating now we can turn it into a live simulation straight away so it's going into a database and we can send it out as a simulation same same you know couple of hours so they've actually made that really effective in terms of um replicating what's circulating in the market thank you that's really good to know yeah. thank you so uh what, what i said is ju just really uh, about the traditional uh fishing fishing campaigns and uh, i feel the probably the the one uh is is very you know if it's updated uh like with with the most sophisticated phishing and with some real world uh phishing emails i think that would be uh very successful yeah uh and another thing i would like to uh, uh discuss uh probably just a little bit beyond the awareness is about the reporting. So I, I do feel uh, because I did have some uh, user studies with uh, with our participants and uh, and we find more than 10 people are willing to report the phishing, even they are quite sure uh, that is phishing. And uh, um, I, I think one uh, one reason is they can't get a response all the time because and they can't see any benefits even uh, learning the new knowledge like if I report the phishing email then I know it is correct and I know uh, who uh, who is sent with what intention and then that that will be the benefit I can get but without that kind of benefit that then users are not uh, probably just mostly ignore it and even not trying to delete it so that's from my opinion but if we can get an uh, increase uh, into um, like implement the reporting process into 
like the current uh, training or campaign, I think that would be also uh, useful, but that's um, only my um, opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. That's quite uh, th that's a very useful point, actually, because the more feedback we can provide to uh, the uh, organizations, uh, departments that protect us, uh, I guess that's uh, and also the feedback that we get that our actions are actually contributing to the safety of the organization. That would be a motivator for for us as uh, users to do the right thing and do the right thing in terms of reporting and not just ignoring the phishing email. I personally can say that there are times when I've seen a phishing simulation and I have ignored it. And before we had that report of phishing, uh, I would just ignore it. So I knew it's phishing, I'm not going to touch it. Uh, and I know it's a simulation, but I, there was no incentive for me to go and report it because I knew it was just a test and I passed the test in my mind. So what, what would you suggest for users like that? Like how could we, be encouraged to do the right thing and report every time because that'll show you that we are aware and we know what to do. And I mean, uh, Fiona, Fam, uh, either of you can take that. When when you click on a simulation from RMIT, you get a um, congratulations. It depends on if you send something to the the report phishing mailbox, which is our a mailbox we've set up. Um, which is the same as the fish alert icon. You get a thanks, you've helped us. There's three categories. Thanks, you've got onto us, or no, this is okay, but thanks for checking, um, or there's a third one. Um, it's all very positive and favourable. It's warm and fuzzy because the last thing you want is for an interaction with the cybersecurity area to be about a stick and, you know, you've done the wrong thing. So it's nothing like that. Even if you clicked on a, a, a um, fishing thing, you would not, be reprimanded as such. It's not what we want. Um, and similarly, if they click on a simulation landing page, we've spent a lot of time going through the methodical queue types that they miss so that in their own time where they're not in under any pressure, they can actually, and, and each, each simulation landing page follows the same principles so that they're looking and thinking about those tips when they see another email and it's part of that learning that becomes like a rote practice you're looking at the you know xyz and there's a it's quite a detailed landing page we actually spent a lot of time this year refreshing them all and customizing them so that people would go on that journey yeah because there's about oh we've got a a a rating tool that we use to um measure the difficulty of um, simulations and so there's I think there's probably about 40 different Q types that we rate and talk to those under about five or six different categories. That's amazing Fiona that's excellent. Fam do you have anything to add to that? Um, so are we talking about like whether we should encourage or how we test uh, the end user awareness right? Yeah so and if we encourage <clears throat> what incentive can we give them to report uh, and to do the right thing. Okay. Um, in fact, I, I have noticed uh, one of my colleagues, you know, when he clicked on that RMIT test, you know, as phishing test, and then uh, he got a message that you know, we just tested you like this and you have clicked on a suspicious link. And he was upset, you know, he was upset that, uh, why did not you tell me in advance before you test? I, I just overheard that, I'm, like, I'm laughing. I'm like, that's the whole point. <laughs> Right, you can't tell you in advance, otherwise oh, I'm going to send you a test, okay? And then please detect. Then you you pull, you check. That's not that's not the natural environment. In natural environment, it's unexpected, in natural, and and that means the test work, right? For me, the for me as well, uh, you the user would learn when they when they feel a bit of of um kind of a victim can feel a bit of painful, honestly, a bit of embarrassed. And I did it myself. I got an email uh, from RMIT, um, and the, the content is so attractive, it's so tempting that I have to reply. <laughs> and then I click on the report, and then I realize, oh no, and, you know, I make a mid text. It's a very embarrassing mid text because we, I teach about security, I, I teach about human behavior, and I'm a victim. And that I love it. That's the whole point that you need to make the test as real as possible, right? And then the user can 
can learn from that and be more cautious next time. And I'm sure every time now I receive an email from RMIT, I will double check everything. <laughs> so um, so it, it, I think to encourage this user, it actually, yes, we need to have periodical uh, awareness session. Uh, we don't actually tell them when we test, but we say that we have regular testing. But, but I don't think that we tell them next week we will test <laughs> a bunch of email. Uh, and then the user, you know, they left in times when they get, get very confident, very you know, risk free. And then suddenly uh, we just have a, um, a random test and that will let the user on way on alert, right? Not very really scared, but on alert and keep you know, very common sense, uh, cautious, and that will, will maintain that, that you know, uh, attention awareness for long term. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, fam. I, I think that's really important because uh, at the end of the day, we all want to get through our emails quickly. And I, I saw <laughs> one of the messages as well. It's also a time pressure thing to make sure we get through things. But uh, uh, it's so important for us to be aware when to stop wh what to look for and then how to report the right thing. So um, I'm just looking at time. We possibly don't have time for any more questions, but as we wrap up, I think <laughs> Discussion. We could go on for another hour on this topic, I think, because there's so much to talk about and there's so much in this rapidly evolving landscape. Uh, and as the attackers get smarter and smarter, we have to become smarter and smarter as end users to, to be that you know human firewall. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you as we wrap up, what are the common trends that you have seen that are emerging uh, in phishing attacks? And um, what are the recent approaches that you have seen and that that could be really effective today? Uh, I think I'll start with uh, Tina and then we'll move around. Yep, uh, so I can see the common trends is uh, users are, uh, the fishers are trying to leverage the le legitimate service instead of the malicious content like before. So according to the Google browser, uh, uh, statistic we find uh, in last year the uh, Google has registered like 1.69 million uh, phishing uh, websites and it has uh, rise to more than 2.1 million this year and for the for the um, but for the malicious website is just one uh, just 20 uh, 20 thousand something uh, from last year and still 20 uh, 27 or 28 this year so uh, so the so f because um, the current security um, tools are really um, really brilliant and cybersecurity experts are trying really hard, so uh, they are, they are using the legitimate service. Uh, one example I can give is uh, as during the COVID situation, we are working at home, and we are uh, currently try, uh, using the like productivity service like Google Drive or. Uh, and uh, uh, Dropbox, something like that. And uh, the fishers also trying to abuse it. Like the they use the Google uh, Google Forms uh, and uh, pretend to be a uh, uh, like AT and T uh, and uh, request the users to fill in their account uh, account numbers and passwords and things like that. Uh, so you can see that the whole way is totally legitimate, and it cannot be detected by any of the detection. Um, engines, uh, unless they know the, how they play with that. Um, so I think currently uh, there are many phishing uh, detection methods. As I, I can see a question in the chat uh, is uh, like AI in phishing detection. So I, I think there are many methods using machine learning to detect, trying to uh, extract the phishes from the phishing itself, from the subject content, links, etc., uh, and also some uh, something using. Uh, AI like neural networks and to analyze the the like using natural language processing to analyze the semantic or synthetic things from the content uh, and uh, uh, also analyze the link like using uh, the blacklisting to block the the one reported or uh, they find uh, and the more advanced way recently I can say is to analyze the visual um, the the visual. Uh, features from the web page like they they pre-click the link and to analyze the the snapshot and to see uh, whether the, the page is trying to impersonate a specific company like uh, they, they find the logo in there like like if it's a paper and then they look at the link look at the domain name and whether they match if 
if they find the web page is very similar, but the domain name doesn't match, then it, it will be considered as phishing. Um, and uh, um, maybe an, uh, and another uh, angle is uh, we're trying to make it ex expandable, like expandable AI. We're not just telling users uh, whether this is phishing or not. Instead, we we'll tell why the the methods consider this is phishing. Like we detect the it is trying to impersonate a uh, a specific brand and uh, uh, the link not match and uh, how how does it work and the workshop what actions should you do trying to give uh, more uh, meaningful information to the users and ask them to make their final decisions thank you thank you tina that was um, very useful to know that there is uh, so much still to be done in this area because you know things are evolving so fast fam i'd just like to know your take on this what are the yeah. recent that you've seen so um yeah a few a few new trends right now about fishing is that they are the fish are getting smarter and get more effort right to craft the message uh so we have a number of play as uh, tina said at the beginning we've got spear fishing now getting more popular so they no longer you know spam type attacks they actually craft the message by the, the receiver by the organization uh, we I have seen email that actually sent to a staff to an, in the accounting email from a known customer. Of course, they they would you know, affect that uh, sender, and the content is simply uh, this is the account. Please pay them the the pending invoice. So it it sounds very convincing. It looks from a same you know, a company that the accountant knows, and if they don't do the double check you know, in the system, they would just open the invoice. And when you open an invoice, that's it. That the weapons that they expect you to, or they ask you to enter a password to open the invoice, and then it's certainly you you enter your own email account just to open an invoice from a third party. So they got a lot more smarter, and more targeted. The second one is what we call the whirling a whirling attack. So it's no longer just your end user, as some of the audience said. Now they're attacking CEO, CIO. You know, is the high executive level, and then once. And that is actually multiple step. They would try to compromise the account, and then you know they can get into that account and send email to the accounting or subordinates and ask them to forward money or to authorize payment. And then of course, when you receive an email from your boss saying you do something, well, I would do it. So this group will in the text is a lot more like aiming at the high level, and then they cascade down the message to um, a lower lower levels. And I'm not sure if you have seen it, but we have seen a lot of new phishing attacks on social media. So we received message from Facebook, from um, uh, Skype, <laughs> that form a known friend and say, you know, we just ran, ran, I just ran out money, please forward me $50, $100 to, to buy a new phone card. Um, and, and, and it's very convincing because that's actually that account had been compromised. And if you don't check carefully, then then certainly right. Um, so that is very popular now because the, of the social media. And then phone calls and SNS, uh, SMS are also new weapons. Uh, uh, even though 94% of this, the phishing attack are from emails, but now getting more on SMS and and um, uh, mobile phone as well. So that is some new trend. In terms of the attack, I saw a lot of people asking questions like how phishing attacks, uh, how phishing detection work. So it, they check a number of, you know, check the URL, they check known URL, they check uh, the content, it did lots of spelling and grammars, uh, they check the greeting, even you know, in, in most phishing email, they just greet in general, uh, dear and hi without name. And when you see something just dear, then you know that something you know, would be uh, wrong. Machine learning is also a new technique, so because it can adapt to the content that keep changing. Um, another method that we use now a lot of like large email provider, they, they actually have you know, kind of collective uh, intelligence. So now they look, they don't look at a single company right to filter. It's very difficult to detect that. They look at at the main gateways where every email going through, and then they can see the trends that there's a spam, there's a phishing uh, campaigns that launch, and then they even stop at the uh, at the at the common gateways. Uh, they use sender reputation to to see. What kind of reputation from the sender? Uh, so a lot of them are spam. They actually have very low reputation, and then email server will stop even you know, ac you know, accepting that email. So that is some of the kind of uh, 
collaborative and 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 large scales um, uh, in terms of you know, uh, preventing and detecting spam or uh, phishing attacks. Thank you. Thanks. I know it's run out of time, so. Absolutely. That's very insightful to know that I think a key word you mentioned is collaboration. So when the organizations collaborate, we're more effective against these sorts yeah. of attacks. Thank you so much. And I'd like to hear from Fiona uh, as we wrap up. What are the trends that you've seen emerging and uh, what have you seen as being most effective at this point? Oh, you're on mute, Fiona. It's, it's more around the obviously business email conference less uh, we haven't seen a great uh, prevalence of it in the uni it's definitely around the themes which you know australia wide was covid and vaccination related um the challenge that we have which is worthwhile pointing out you've got to be mindful it's very difficult for me to get approval to do a simulation on that sort of thing because it causes mayhem in an organization where we are actually wanting vaccination certificates to be uploaded and things like that. So to get the people area to endorse a simulation that does that, whilst we've got sort of one hand saying, yes, we support simulations, when we want to do something that is so closely aligned to the attack frameworks, it becomes very challenging. Um, and also then the challenge for us also is the other mediums they're using, vishing. If we were going to go and do vishing campaigns, and vishing being targeted more like at the senior executives to reach them when they're actually going to pick up their phone. Maybe you'd, they'd pick up their phone in a meeting, but the timing of sending out these vishing simulations is also challenging. So we've certainly got some challenges in terms of the educational space sitting behind the scenes of what you're, what the front you see, which is um, making it challenging for us as well. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, I think this has been a really, really great discussion. Thank you to all three of you, uh, Tina, Pham, and uh, Fiona, for your insights into this really, uh, I guess, very pertinent topic. Uh, and I'm sure the lessons are continuing to be learned as we speak. And uh, we look forward to hearing more updates from each of you uh, in the coming months. Uh, but thanks to everybody for joining us for this uh, panel discussion. I hope you've got plenty of ideas and things to talk about and research. Uh, but until next time and the next series, I uh, will be signing off. So thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Bye.